Hello, I'm Mr. Eliason and welcome to World History. Today we're going to talk about the rise of the Iron Curtain in Europe in the aftermath of World War II and how this divided the continent between communism and capitalism and really set the stage for the Cold War in Europe. So here are our objectives for today. Take a moment, take them in, and let's move forward. Divided Europe really happened at the Yalta Conference. This was a conference that happened back during World War II when it's still FDR, Churchill, and Stalin as the leaders of the big three. The important decision at Yalta was the decision that the country that liberated an area from Axis tyranny was gonna be the country that was gonna rebuild that region. There were promises of free and fair elections, but there was a general sense, sense of wartime uh, continuity and wartime cooperation between the three powers, with the understanding that they would all kind of work together to put Europe back together, and that the countries that the Soviets would take responsibility for rebuilding the eastern parts of Europe, the United States and Great Britain would take responsibility for rebuilding the western parts, and that both sides would cooperate with each other and have free and fair elections, which is an easy thing to say when you're unified by a common enemy like Adolf Hitler. But in the aftermath of this and in the aftermath of the death of FDR and the end of the war in Europe, the Potsdam Conference in Germany was a much more contentious atmosphere for a whole host of different reasons. Part of it is that Truman was much more skeptical of Stalin, and Stalin had proved that his promises of free and fair elections might not be totally free and fair. So those are pieces there. We also see Stalin trying to increase his power in a variety of different areas. We're already seeing him trying to get involved in northern China, which we're going to talk about tomorrow. There's a real question as far as Soviet expansion into other parts of the, of the globe. And the American monopoly on the atomic bomb, which Truman revealed at Potsdam, also created tensions between the former wartime allies. And so whereas Yalta was a conference and a summit of mostly cooperation and good feelings between the allied powers, Potsdam was much more contentious and much more difficult. Truman gives a famous speech in the aftermath of this, sort of laying out the stakes of this new Cold War. So take a moment, pause and read. And it's going to be our goal going forward, the United States' goal, to try to slow the expansion of Soviet Russia. And this is incredibly problematic because Russia doesn't necessarily demobilize in the aftermath of World War II, at least not fully. The Red Army is still sort of poised along the area that they have conquered during the war. And the United States doesn't have the economic or the political will to fight another war against the Soviet Union immediately. And so if Stalin so chose, he could expand and take over all of the rest of Europe. And there'd be very little that the Allies could do to stop him. The Red Army would be able to likely sweep the, uh, out, the rest of the Allied forces out of the way. And Russia would now control all of Europe, and Europe would be a continent of almost exclusively communist governments. This was somewhat problematic, and of course, the way that the, the only tool that the United States has to stop this is their atomic monopoly. And so we're going to see some threats of atomic bombing, most famously over Iran, where Truman threatens to use nuclear weapons if Stalin doesn't withdraw his troops. And so really the, uh, the ability of the Americans to use, the, use nuclear weapons is going to be one of their few trump cards in trying to prevent Russians from expanding and taking over. We see, uh, we see propaganda starting to emerge from both of these sides. You should definitely take a moment and watch this video on Churchill's Iron Curtain speech if you have time. And this divide between the capitalist and communist worlds becomes known as the Iron Curtain. After this speech that uh, Churchill gets, gives once he's out of power, when he's traveling through the United States in Fulton, Missouri, what we end up seeing is anyone who, you know, uh, any leader in Eastern Europe who adopts a sort of pro-capitalist or a pro-Western stance is going to be killed and is going to be replaced. And I guess maybe I shouldn't say that the president of Czechoslovakia was killed because, uh, you know, again, he fell out of a window and died and then was replaced by a leader of Czechoslovakia who was much more pro-Stalin and who would reject any type of aid from the West. And so we see this clear divide amongst along the European continent between the communist and the capitalist parts of Europe. Our fear, of course, is that Stalin is going to try to expand communism into areas that he uh, does not previously control it. And that and Stalin's fear is that information from capitalism and sort of the... Um, 
seductive nature of capitalist economic growth is going to corrupt Eastern Europe and limit his power. And so we see over time this divide between the countries solidify, travel is cut off, communication is cut off between the two sides, and you get, again, a continent divided by this sort of ideological barrier of communism versus capitalism. In order to try to stop the spread of communism, the United States is going to embrace an economic approach to some extent. The Marshall Plan is a plan in which money is provided to Western Europe, both to rebuild these countries that are devastated by war, but also to make communism less appealing to a lot of these areas. And so we're going to see a, a lot of money spent by the United States to rebuild Western Europe, to sort of solidify the strength of these capitalist countries, and to, again, limit the effects of communism. Specifically, Greece and Turkey on, are targeted under Truman because there's some fear that the devastation that Greece and Turkey faced in the aftermath of war is going to make them susceptible to communism. And so the idea being, if we can show the benefits of being allied with the United States, then communism and Stalin is going to be much less tempting for the people of Eastern Europe. The Soviets respond uh, predictably, accusing the United States of using economic aid as a weapon of ideological warfare, which, I mean, again, not totally false, but not totally true. And so this sets the stage for the Cold War, in which we're not actually fighting with Soviet Russia, because that would be utterly devastating and World War III would end us all. But we are pushing back against Russia in the ways that we can, you know, using all the tools short of warfare to stop the spread of the Soviet Union and communism. One of the early crises of the war is known as the Berlin Crisis, where Stalin tries to seize control of Western Berlin. As you hopefully remember from last time, Berlin was a city that was divided into four different zones. Because of the economic devastation of England and France, the Western zones, the British, French, and American zones, are going to be combined together into both a West Germany and a West Berlin. So Stalin is going to close off all roll, road and rail traffic to West Berlin, cut fuel and power supplies, and basically force the people of Berlin to open up their doors to the Red Army, in which case Berlin is going to disappear behind the Iron Curtain. In order to prevent this from happening, Harry Truman is going to carry off, carry off one of the great sort of logistical feats in human history. The Berlin Airlift is an almost year-long airdrop in which we provide West Berlin with all the food, fuel, supplies they need in order to resist and continue to function. Stalin, of course, does not want to shoot down these planes because it would be an act of war, despite the fact that we're violating Soviet airspace. And so the Berlin Airlift continues almost indefinitely. And eventually Stalin gives up and reopens traditional paths into West Berlin, and the United States and their allies are able to keep control of half of the city. The sort of back and forth of the Berlin crisis really represents the type of conflict we see in the Cold War with a combination of, you know, sort of toe, setting your, stepping a toe over the line and seeing how the other side reacts, basically trying to use things that are provocative but not too provocative in order to establish your advantage, and then, you know, basically challenging the other side to respond. In the end, our strategy towards the Soviets is outlined here, so take a moment and pause, read. This strategy is known as containment. The United States is going to do everything possible to slow the influence of the Soviet Union and to try to stop communism from spreading. The Soviet Union is going to do the same thing, attempting to stop the United States from gaining influence in other parts of the world, undermining pro-U.S. regimes and trying to sort of limit American influence. And both sides are going to participate in a whole bunch of espionage, covert operations, proxy wars, and economic str struggles in order to demonize the other and to gain as much advantage as is possible. And so this is how the Cold War is going to be fought. We also see tangible permanent military alliances. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization is the U.S.'s military alliance with us and our capitalist democratic allies. The Warsaw Pact is the Soviet Union's military alliance with their autocratic communist allies. And the most important piece of NATO, the NATO Charter is Article 5, which still holds to this day. This is, so take a moment, pause and read. This is the Mutual Defense Pact, that an attack on any one of these countries is an attack on all of them. And it's important because it means that any limited war in Europe would quickly expand into a general war between the United States and the Soviet Union. 
We also see espionage becoming pretty common. The Soviet Union tests their first atomic bomb in 1949, and it is revealed that the Soviets had a series of spies within our nuclear program. The presence of communist spies within the United States kicks off a red scare in the United States. You'll learn much more about this in your U.S. history classes, but it's an attempt to find and discover communist spies and infiltrators within American society. It's going to lead to the blacklisting, the economic and social isolation of people accused, and leads to a lot of unfounded accusations and a general sense of unease within American society. The uh, architect of this Red Scare, or the guy most associated with it, is Joseph McCarthy. Here he is talking about the list of communists that he knows within the State Department. And the phrase McCarthyism is often used to describe this sort of unfounded search for enemies used by political opportunists to gain power because he never revealed his list of known communists. And it was revealed once they started, uh, it became clear to everyone once they started televising the hearings that he was mostly bullying people into admitting to stuff that they probably did not do. So he's going to fall from power and that's going to lead to the collapse of the Red Scare. We also see the development of bigger and more powerful nuclear weapons. Into the 1950s, both sides are going to test their hydrogen bombs. We're going to develop new delivery systems, ballistic missiles, nuclear submarines. And we're going to embrace this idea of mutually assured destruction. The idea that war between the two great superpowers will be impossible because both sides are prepared to use maximum nuclear force, massive retaliation, to utterly obliterate the populations of the other in, to, in case of warfare. Here's our atomic blitzkrieg plan in which we pledge to nuke the Soviet Union out of existence as a deterrent to war. And so we'll look at that and the strategy, that theory being tested in future lessons. But for now, just know we now are prepared to completely destroy the Soviet Union. Stalin is going to solidify his control over the Soviet Union, bring back his cult of personality if it ever left. World War II is going to mostly raise Stalin's stature within the Soviet Union as the single leader. Here's a hymn to Stalin, the provider of everything good. And so we get this cult of civic religion around Stalin. Stalin keeps control of the upper echelons of Soviet society, his inner circle, by playing them off each other, isolating them in turn, bringing them in, kicking them out. You know, uh, it's a lot of like sort of high school level social bullying amongst his supporters. And he's not going to elevate any one of them as his heir. And so he's going to remain as the sole leader of the Soviet Union with everyone else within Soviet society significantly below him. And we get another round of purges after World War II as Stalin prevents or attempts to prevent any of the war heroes who sort of uh, rose in stature during the war from becoming too prominent lest they challenge his power. And so we're going to get another round of purges and Stalin's going to get really paranoid after World War II that someone would rise up to undermine him or that capitalist societies are trying to undermine his rule. And so we'll dive into that when we get into the post-Stalin Soviet Union. But for now, Stalin is Stalin. His Soviet Union is always this totalitarian, horrible dictatorship predicated on propaganda, complete control over society, police terror, all of these things. And World War II has not changed any of that. So that brings us to the end of World War II in Europe and its aftermath. For next time, we're going to move over to Asia and talk about the effects of World War II there. But for now, thank you for listening.